Good evening and welcome to those of you here on campus and those joining us from home. Uh, my name is Richard Amesbury. I'm the director of Arizona State University's School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies. It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, this evening to what I believe is one of the highlights of this year's Humanities Week. So Humanities Week uh, celebrates scholarship that illuminates the world of human experience. And since historians and philosophers and scholars of religion are part of that human world, research in the humanities tends to be engaged. We're always participant observers, part of the world that we're seeking to understand. Now this evening we're in for a real treat and I'm pleased that you're here to experience it with us. So it's my privilege to introduce our speaker this evening, my colleague, Dr. Curtis Austin, Associate Professor of History in the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies. An historian of the struggle for, human, for civil rights, uh, Dr. Austin is the author of the critically acclaimed and award-winning book, Up Against the Wall, Violence in the Making and Unmaking of the Black Panther Party, which is based on extensive oral histories with former members of the party. His current research projects include a history of the Black Power Movement, currently in press, and a history of the San Francisco Eight, former members of the Black Panther Party who were arrested in 2007 on homicide charges stemming from a 1971 crime. In addition to traditional sources like published books, newspapers, trial transcripts, government documents, and police reports, Dr. Austin uses extensive oral histories to tell the story of how these eight men uh, convinced the court to dismiss charges against them. Additionally, Dr. Austin is collaborating on a project titled The Unsung Heroes of the Civil Rights Movement, which is the subject of this evening's talk. Recognizing the importance of recording, preserving, and making publicly available the stories of ordinary Americans who participated in the civil rights movement, its unsung heroes, Dr. Austin and his colleague Matthew Barr at UNC Greensboro are conducting dozens of interviews and hope to have nearly 200 oral histories available and archived online through ASU's Hayden Library by the end of the year with a book uh, to be published in 2023. Now, to ensure that these heroes not remain unsung, uh, Dr. Austin will be joined this evening by the award-winning Phoenix Boys Choir, an Arizona institution. Founded in 1947, the Phoenix Boys Choir has programs featuring training in voice, music theory, and performance for boys ages seven to 18, they're the only uh, Grammy-winning award, uh, uh, Grammy award-winning uh, children's choir in Arizona and also an honorary Phoenix uh, point of pride. The choir is led by artistic director Herbert Washington, who's a Phoenix Boys Choir alumnus and known for his dynamic teaching style and his ability to instill a love of the choral arts. He's a frequent uh, choral clinician, conductor, lecturer, and adjudicator for regional festivals, workshops, and conferences around the country. So they'll be uh, joining us after the Q&A with Dr. Austin. Now we're grateful uh, for the support of SRP, which provides internships for our students and which is generously sponsoring our reception, which will be taking place on the ingrained uh, patio. Uh, here on the second floor uh, after this evening's event and to which all of you are uh, warmly invited. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Curtis Austin, Herbert Washington, and the Phoenix Boys Choir. Thank you, Richard, and uh, thank all of you for being here tonight. Uh, it might not sound like it right now, but I'm really excited uh, about this. I'm also really nervous, and, and I've given hundreds of talks, but I don't know why I'm always nervous anyway. Uh, but glad to be here and uh, looking forward to any dialogue we might have 
at the end. And one of the strange things about growing older is I can't read my notes with my glasses on, but I can't see the screen without my glasses. And so you'll wonder what's, what's going on with that guy. And I'm, I just told you what, what's going on. Um, so again, thank you for, for coming out. Um, I'm very honored to have this opportunity to be with you. And I want to thank a few people and a few entities before I get started. One is I have very deep gratitude uh, to ASU's Institute for Humanities Research. Uh, their financial and material support is making this particular aspect of the Unsung Heroes Project possible. I also want to thank uh, the Shippers, uh, the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies Public History Endowment. Um, they made it possible for us to do some really interesting and uh, extensive filming just this past summer. And you'll see some of the clips from some of that work. And so we, we couldn't have done that without um, their support. Um, they are my heroes. And I use the definition for hero. Uh, it's, it's really loose. Like most people can be my heroes. And all you have to do is just uh, be around and, and do your job. Uh, and lots of people that I'm around do that. And so I want to to thank some of the heroes uh, we have here tonight, and hopefully you'll you'll meet them at the reception afterwards. But uh, we have a lot of very kind and thoughtful and capable people, um, staff members who put this event on. And I want to just mention their names because uh, they're special to me. And I think you are comfortable. Uh, I think you feel okay. I know I do. You wouldn't if they hadn't done this. So, so special thanks to Becky Sang, Erica May, Rachel Bunny, Marissa Timmerman. All of these people, and probably a lot more people, did the important logistical work that made this event possible. I, I'm sure there are people whose names I miss. But just as we've gotten into the habit of uh, acknowledging um, the fact that we're on Native people's land as we do our work, I think it's important that we acknowledge uh, the people who make our jobs possible. Uh, they don't just make it easy for us to do our job. They make it possible for the university to run. Now, obviously, uh, faculty research is important. You know, what administrators are doing um, is extremely important. But the fact of the matter is, the university would not run without staff members doing what they do very quietly in the background, almost always unacknowledged. And I'm one of those people who always rely on <laughs> staff people. And so I would be remiss if I didn't say um, thank you to them for, for helping us to come here and have this opportunity to share with each other tonight. So um, the unsung heroes of the civil rights movement. The notion of unsung heroes who sacrificed their lives and livelihood uh, during this tumultuous period is not new. Even during uh, the civil rights movement, you had people demanding uh, to be acknowledged. And actually, these demands turned into the women's movement. They turned into the gay liberation movement. And so what I'm doing here is, is not exactly new. Hopefully, it's revealing to you, but it's been going on for a long time. People have been saying, you know, it's not just the big wigs who need to be acknowledged. It's all of us who need to be acknowledged. Um, and if you want to learn about all that kind of stuff, just come into, you know, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and take a class, and we'll teach that to you. Um, but this evening, what I want to talk about are uh, just a couple of people who sacrificed their jobs, who sacrificed their families and their futures for the betterment of humanity and uh, for perfecting our unfortunately flawed democracy. Some of the people that I'm going to mention even sacrifice their lives. And I'll just uh, start with... Uh, people that you're, you're familiar with, right? You're familiar with uh, the faces here, uh, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr., who are associated with uh, foundational attempts to change society in, in this country. Uh, the Montgomery boycott just being just one of them. 
Uh, another image there of King and all the men, you know, there's Fred Shuttlesworth and Ralph Abernathy, um, Andrew Young there in that picture, right? We think that they're the ones who made this, you know, major boycott happen. And, and we're wrong when we think that, right? It's just not right. You need to come take my class and I'll get into the details about it. But um, they made some phone calls, gave some awfully good speeches, but the people who actually made it happen uh, actually happened not to be men at all. It's women. Uh, there was this young 15-year-old who, who first actually got people up in an uproar about the buses, and her name is Claudette Coven. And some of us know that name. She's come up recently uh, over the past few years, but most of us do not, right? And Claudette Coven actually is one of the main signatories to a case that became known as Browder versus Gale that actually got rid of segregation on Alabama buses. And um, I'm not saying that King is not important, Abernathy is not important, they are, but the people who made that boycott run uh, were women um, in the Women's Political Council, uh, led by Joanne Robinson. She gathered these folks, a lot of whom taught at Alabama State University, and said, we're gonna make this boycott happen. And they actually went to King and asked him to lead this new organization, the Montgomery Improvement Organization. And, and this 26-year-old kid told them, no. You know, it's like, I'm busy, I'm a preacher. Uh, not gonna be doing that. He just you know, got his PhD at Crozier up in, in Boston and was enjoying his job as a preacher, which you know, I imagine is pretty enjoyable. Um, and when he told them no, they went to Coretta and said, hey, Coretta, uh, you know, can you get uh, Michael? I mean, we call him Martin, but he was born Michael King, if you didn't know that. Um, and he becomes known as Martin a little bit later, but he's not famous now as I'm describing this conversation, right? He's just this 26-year-old kid with a new job. And they say, can you tell Michael that we're not asking him, right? Uh, and she said something to him, and next thing you know, King is president of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Montgomery Improvement Association. So just a little uh, bit of background on how you can have these unsung heroes in your midst and completely look over them because the New York Times and the other media want to focus on men, you know, or leaders or spokespeople. But it, it literally was um, these women who made sure that that boycott lasted for a year and made sure that those buses desegregated. Uh, so just wanted to, to share that with you. Uh, you've, of course, heard of uh, Linda Brown. Uh, in 1954, the Supreme Court handed down Brown versus Board of Education and, you know, the decision to desegregate all the public schools in the country. But not a lot happened as a result of that decision. In 1955, the Supreme Court issued what it called Brown II, right? And said, hey, you really need to desegregate yeah, now, but they didn't say now, they said with all deliberate speed, um, which school districts across the country, not just in the South, interpreted uh, as whenever we get ready. So for example, uh, the school district in the town I grew up in uh, integrated for the first time in 1969, right? So 15 years after Brown. And you'd think, oh, well, you know, he sounds like he's from the South, and you'd be right about that. I grew up in Mississippi. But the school districts in Columbus, Ohio, desegregated in 1970. So all deliberate speed uh, was not speedy at all. There was a lot of pushback, in other words, against um, this kind of, um, these efforts at equality. Uh, we know, for example, that back to, to Mississippi, that James Meredith was, you know, wanting to integrate the University of Mississippi. We call it Ole Miss, but they didn't want him to get in. He insisted on it, and President Kennedy, who you see here on the screen, was like, well, we gotta do something because these other things that happened, and I'm gonna talk to you about those other things in just um, a moment. In, in any case, in 1962, uh, they basically force Meredith onto the campus of Ole Miss. Kennedy has to send in the 101st Airborne, he has to send in the National Guard, he has to send in the regular army, and in fact, 
Um, cars are burned. U.S. Marshals are shot. Report, one reporter, uh, a foreign correspondent from, from France, was even killed, right? And then the, our textbooks tell us that we see the dominoes falling after that. <laughs> that. It didn't happen like that. So, but there was a story in Mississippi about this one guy named Clyde Kennard, who many years before the Ole Miss riots, before the incident with James Meredith, tried to desegregate my undergraduate alma mater, the University of Southern Mississippi, which was in Hattiesburg, a small town about 50 miles from the Gulf Coast. Kennard had been a military veteran, just like James Meredith. Uh, he, he'd come back and use his GI Bill to attend school at the very prestigious University of Chicago. Well, he was a political science major and did that for about three years until his father fell ill. And when his father fell ill, he had to take leave of his studies and go back to Mississippi to help his aging mother run uh, the family farm. And when he did that, so it's 1955, his neighbor, uh, I mean, not next door neighbor, but his, his neighbor Emmett Till has just been killed, you know, just, just for being black. He was, you know, the, the story, of course, we get is he was killed for whistling at a white woman. But if you read um, Tim Tyson's The Blood of Emmett Till, or if you take my class, you'll find out he was killed for being black, not because of something he uh, said or did. In any case, it's a very difficult time, a very tension-filled time, not just in the South, but throughout the nation. So people don't want to voluntarily desegregate. And so Kennard decides he's going to push the envelope anyway, gets the farm up and running, goes, you know, he doesn't want to go the 1,500 miles back to Chicago. He's got one more year, so he wants to go five miles down the road to Southern Miss. And the president of that university is like, uh, how about no? And he's like, well, you know, Supreme Court says anybody can go to school anywhere they want. And the president says, we don't care what the Supreme Court says. You know, this is, this is Mississippi. He refused to withdraw his application. And so the president of the University of Southern Mississippi, which at the time was called Mississippi Southern College, um, got with uh, local law enforcement, members of the state legislature, and came up with the plan to get rid of Kennard. Well, you could not um, apply and be admitted to a university in Mississippi if you had a felony on your record. So what McCain did was to invite Kennard to campus to talk about the situation. And he did, and the talk was uh, literally like 12 minutes long, and it was mostly McCain telling him, you're not coming to school. And so he left the little meeting and went back to his car, and there were two police officers there. Those police officers arrested him for speeding. Now, his car was parked. Uh, but he was arrested for speeding. One drove him to jail, one drove his car, and he's being photographed and fingerprinted. And the one who drove the car walks in with a handful of uh, liquor bottles. Mississippi's a dry state. And says, look what I found, right? And uh, they charged Kennard with possession of liquor and uh, made him pay $600. When that failed, uh, because he appealed it, what they didn't know was, uh, even before it was popular, Kennard was both uh, a vegan and he didn't drink. And it's a small town. Everybody in town knew he didn't drink, except apparently the people that planted the bottles in his car. So that didn't work. Court overturned it. Then they decided, I got it. You know, we're going to do it another way. They went to this local co-op. Stole some chicken feet, had this 19-year-old guy named John Lee Roberts steal the chicken feet, planted on Kennard's farm, and then arrested Kennard for stealing the chicken feet. Brought him to court for that, tried him, and an all-white jury convicted him of breaking into the co-op and stealing the chicken feet and sentenced him to seven years hard labor in Parchman Penitentiary. That's an image of the courtroom where he was uh, convicted. Uh, less than 10 minutes, sent him up to Parchman, uh, tortured him, beat him, put him on uh, a, work, <clears throat> a work gang where he had to um, pick cotton, and then they poisoned him. 
as if, you know, his imprisonment were not enough. So of course, now he's got this felony on his record. If he gets it out, gets it overturned, uh, it'll be a problem because now he's poisoned. Well, Kennard winds up dying on the 4th of July of 1963. There was this outpouring of interest in his case, and it's Kennard's case that actually causes the dominoes to start falling. It's not that James Meredith is not important, but it's this particular story that leads to universities in Virginia and the Carolinas, uh, even in Texas, um, to desegregate. So we don't know Kennard's story because, I see, he died in July of 63, a much more famous um, civil rights activist, a guy by the name of Megger Evers, died the month before he did. And he died because somebody shot him in the back, right? He's working, doing his NAACP work, trying to desegregate lunch counters, trying to integrate uh, downtown stores, get people jobs, do voter registration. And uh, the White Citizens Council, the state legislature, the Ku Klux Klan, got together and uh, said, we got to get rid of this N-word and got rid of him. And that overshadowed Kennard's death. A month after Kennard's death, another thing overshadowed uh, his sacrifice, and that was a march on Washington, where King made that famous, I have a dream speech. So still, nobody knows about Kennard because all these things are happening. Not even a month after that, about three weeks after that, we have the killing of four little girls in Birmingham, where Klan's members, which the FBI had completely infiltrated and so knew who was involved in, in the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, um, killed them while they were, uh, they had just finished choir practice and they were getting ready for Sunday school, right? So all of these other things take over the headlines. We don't know anything about Kennard, and as if that were not enough, we had, not long after that, the assassination of the president. So lots going on, and what we're trying to do with this project is to say that there are other people outside of the Martin Luther Kings and James Merediths, who we know about, who made sacrifices uh, to get us to where we are today. So we have a lot of organizations that pop up on the scene. And one of these organizations is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And these individuals decide that they are going to start a series of sit-ins. You've heard about these sit-ins, right? Uh, they they want to um, be served at lunch counters. The order of the day during this particular period in American history is that black people can buy books and pens and pencils and other things in these um, stores, the Woolworth stores, the Cresses of the world. Um, but they can't buy food. They can't sit at the lunch counter. If they want food, they can actually have it, but they have to go to a back door or a back window. And um, uh, people thought this was unfortunate, and so they wanted to do something about it. And so they started to uh, sitting in. And all over the country, we see these sit-ins take place. These young people are getting together. And before you know it, they start to organize themselves. And one of the people that helps them to organize is a not so unsung hero, it's a woman by the name of Ella Baker. And Ella Baker tells these uh, kids who are involved in these sit-ins, under no circumstances should you allow yourself to be integrated with these larger organizations like the NAACP, like uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s Southern Christian Leadership Conference. You need your own organization. And that's what they do. They get together black and white kids all over the country from the north from the south and the east and the west, and they form uh, SNCC. And they start to work. And it's not just sitting in. It's a whole lot of things. It's You've heard of the Freedom Rides, for example. Thousands of people went on these Freedom Rides where they got on buses in the north and came south. Thousands of people went to jail. This project is going to uncover the stories of those people. We know about five. We know the names of about five of these thousands of people. We've seen movies and documentaries, and every blue moon you'll see them in a textbook. But this project is going to tell you their stories. Once um, they got beyond that, they decided that they were going to go deeper into the South, they being SNCC. And it's six, 1964 now. And they're going to sponsor something called Freedom Summer. And in Freedom Summer, what they want to do is teach African-Americans to read and write, 
teach them African and African American history, help them integrate public facilities, and get them registered to vote. And what SNCC members, black and white, realized was, you know, black people have been dying for years in this civil rights struggle. And very, very little is happening. They surmised that if white people got beaten, got maimed, got killed, that maybe the government will do something about it. And so they had this huge training at Miami University in Ohio where they got people ready to go to Mississippi. And they set off. I mean, it's, it's crazy that people knew bad things were going to happen, and they still did it. Now, we know folks like Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, who was involved in, in Freedom Summer, one of the leaders of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. There's been books and movies uh, made about her. But what we don't know are the other eight or 900 students who came from, actually there were several from Arizona State and the University of Arizona, some from Stanford University, Harvard and Yale, the University of Washington. They came from all over the country to brave uh, a, a, a Jim Crow Mississippi. Now you can imagine that Mississippians, uh, those in and out of government, are not gonna like this. Right? They're not going to be happy about being, um, they called it an invasion. They're not, going to be, they're not happy about this invasion. And so they start beating people. They start running people out of the state. Uh, if you were a black person and you let one of these kids stay in your house, they might burn your house down. Right? If you're a teacher and you're you know, helping um, these kids who come, you get fired from your teaching job. And one of the things they were uh, trying to do is get black people registered to vote, right? Um, black people at the time in Mississippi made up about 40% of the state's population. And in the county where I'm from, Yazoo County, it's over in the west central part of the state, um, they made up about 80%. But there were no black people on the voting rolls. And if you go deeper into the Delta, a little bit closer to the Mississippi River, uh, black people make up 90 to 95% of these counties. Nobody's on the voting rolls. So if they get on the rolls, we can see that change might come. Well, to prevent that change, there is a lot of widespread violence. And I'm going to um, tell you the story and show you um, the story of this man who helps with this movement because uh, some of those people who came um, were killed, right? Several were killed. But I'm going to talk to you about a, a familiar story uh, that comes out of Freedom Summer. You've probably heard of James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Swerner. So what these activists are trying to do is get the president, get Congress to pass a bill, pass a civil rights law, and say, you know, leave us alone, let us live, that kind of thing. And Congress has been stalling for years. Again, you know, bring all these white people to Mississippi. Maybe something will happen. The white people come and the folks in Mississippi react accordingly. Um, so James Cheney, Michael Swerner, and Andrew Goodman go to Philadelphia, Mississippi. They talk to a group of people in a church about registering to vote. That night, the church burns down, and that's kind of the end of it. But they do not quit. They go back out there. They, their office is in Meridian, which is about an hour from Philadelphia. They go back to Philadelphia uh, because the people call them back. And when they go back, um, Sheriff Rainey, Deputy Sheriff Price, they decide they're going to stop their car. They do. Uh, they, they beat them. Uh, at, at least they, they actually shoot um, Andrew Goodman and Michael Swerner, the two white guys. They, they beat and torture James Cheney. And uh, they kill him, too. They shoot him. And they leave their bodies in an earthen dam. Right? We know that story. You've, you've seen the movies. You've read the books. Um, but what you probably don't know is how this story got out, how it originally got out. And I'm going to share with you one of these unsung heroes. It's a fairly long uh, clip, so bear with me. But he's talking about how he informed 
the authorities about what happened. And this is a guy, his name is Buford Posey, white guy from, from Mississippi, didn't like what he saw and decided to do something about it. And so I might need a little help to, to get this going, but let's see if I don't. Let's, uh, here we have uh, Buford Posey and he's gonna talk to you just a little bit about what happened. Like I said, it's a little bit of a long clip, but I want you to get to know some of these unsung heroes. And so just bear with us here. I realized that you know, they were gonna kill someone. He went to show County County County. 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 get back to the point. I went to see Mickey's morning, and I said, now Mickey, they, they've already burned that church up there, you know, this black Methodist church shot along there. And I said, they going to, they put out the order. I they got a hold. I had a, you know, some in, some informers for me too. I said they put out order the clan and send us you to death. They gonna kill you if you come back. So you stay the hell out of Silver County. People won't live. Oh, he smiled at me. You know, he condescending guy. He was well, you know, he wasn't just about twenty, twenty early twenty twenty four. I think he was something like that. But, uh, he said, uh, oh, Mr. Poole, he said, um, I understand how they feel. I said, Mickey, it, don't make a, it doesn't make a damn what you think about how they feel. I'm telling you what they'll do. They'll kill you. And anybody, anyone's with you. And don't go up, you commit suicide to go to Silver County. Because the sheriff is a Klansman, the deputy sheriff is, and every day, they got 39 auxiliary deputies. All of them are deputy sheriffs, called auxiliary. Deputies. Every day I'm one of them is a Klan member. So, you know, in Shelby County, there's no place for you to be. And you go, and, he, and especially had that, that kid there, you know, he looked like kid. Well, he was a kid, but anyway, um, James Cheney was there, you know. He followed him around. He was with him, you know. I mean, he was kind of, he was, James Cheney was kind of like Johnny Frazier was to Matt Gabbard, you know, they always together. Well, I said, they sure kill you, you James Cheney here, and he introduced me James, and I said, yeah, James Cheney, you go get killed, and anybody you bring with you. Well, he, he see, he had, a, I remember he told me he had a master's degree in sociology from some damn well-known college in New York City. I did thought I'd remember it, but I can't remember it right now. Well, when you leave, but anyway. Uh, and he understood these things, you know. I said, well, I've got no bachelor's degree from Mississippi Southern College, that's USM out here. And I said, that's just an old redneck university, you know, college. But I know damn well I'm one of these rednecks and I know what they're gonna do. Of course, he paid me no attention and, and uh, that uh, other young fellow, Andrew Goodman, he, he arrived in Mississippi, hell, he, I don't guess he ever got unpacked. They sent him from Jackson when he got, he got from, came from Ohio, I believe, University of Miami in Ohio. And uh, then Jackson and Copo sent him on over there to help Mickey. And he got there on a Sunday after, well, he got there on a, I believe, dirt morning or the day before one. But anyway, his first trip out from Rudy was, Mickey was, Ferner was to the Shelby County. Of course, they all three were killed, just like I told me was. But, um, see, I, I, I never forget this. Even people like that, you see, that I tried to explain to them that you had to be careful. I said, oh, hey, you're alive? I said, yeah, but I mean as hell. And, you know, I'm a good shot. And come from good, so-called good family. And I've got a reputation of being dangerous, and by God, that's what I want. I want to cultivate that as much as I can. That's the only way I'm going to stay alive, is be, is be more dangerous than the damn clan is. Because they got me down, too, I know. So anyway, when they, what happened was, the night they were missing, see, it's on a Sunday night. I'll never forget that. June the 21st, 1964. And uh, I... I always, I still do, I set up, I don't die so much. I go to bed at 12 o'clock now. I used to set up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and read. I was bad to read. And, you know, I had a little, a lad lamp in those days, you know, didn't have a lecture out there. Got it before I left, but anyway, just for So anyway, I, was, I read every night current events and history and everything else. You know, from, um, 
that night, I read to about two o'clock. And I had just gone to sleep, and the damn phone rang. And it was a, somebody said, didn't give me a name. I thought I recognized the voice, but anyway, might have, might not. I don't know, it's so damn sleepy. Said, we took care of three of your friends tonight, you're next, and hung up. So I knew who it was. I said, that's the clan, and they've killed. They said, we took care of three of your civil rights friends tonight. I said, they've killed it. I hope it wasn't no swearing in them. I, said, I told him to stay out, but I don't know. He didn't act like he was going to do it. So the next morning, I uh, somebody, next phone call I got was around 8 o'clock, I guess, 8 or 9 o'clock. I said, um, uh, from the co op full office in, uh, in Jackson. I think it was Mickey Swinney's wife, I'm not sure that, but some woman or another. She said, Mickey and, and, uh, and uh, Andy and uh, James Cheney went to Shelby County yesterday and we haven't seen them. And we gave them your name and address and told them to look you up in, in case they got in trouble. I said, I haven't seen them, but I'll tell you where they're at, they're dead. And the woman said, oh, no, 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 don't talk that way, Mr. Foley, don't talk that way. I said, I'm not talking that way, I'm telling you the truth. So, as soon as this person hung up, uh, I called the FBI office in Jackson. Hell, they didn't even have an office there. Just had a phone number. It transferred a call, it called a number in New Orleans. So I called the New Orleans office of the FBI. And told him, Mr. Skill, it was, uh, oh, I guess, 9 or 10 o'clock before I got a hold of him. And so I caught, talked to the man there, said he's an agent in charge. And hell, he didn't seem to be with many of them there. I think there's that three down there that I learned later. And so anyway, he said, took, he, he took my, you know, information, but he was very skeptical, I can tell. I said, well, you can sit on your butt till you get ordered out of Washington. Somebody's going to start raising hell because... There's three, three bodies up here in the Shelby County, and uh, uh, they sneak people, I think. So, uh, uh, Copo or something. Ah, we've heard reports like that before or something. I said, well, you better remember this one, because this, one, this is not a report, this is a fact. I'm delivering you a fact. I was kind of belligerent by the end of myself. Oh, anyway, Tuesday morning, uh, until 11 o'clock, the guy from New Orleans said he was, he showed up at my home. He said, uh, we've been ordered to investigate. Uh, uh, I said, yeah, I know we were a little late, but anyway, so by that time I knew who had been killed. I told him who did it. Well, that's, that's the whole report we got, but we were just told uh, to make a, you know, uh, um, Courtesy called on you, some kind of shit, you know. I said, well, I don't give a damn about the courtesy part or anything like that, but you've got some killers to look at, and they're Ku Klux Klan members, the white knights of Ku Klux Klan. I said, they come out of Laurels, is where they found it at, and told them the guy's name down there. And I said, the local big wheel, here's a would-be preacher named um, Edgar Ray Killing. And I know him, so. Uh, he's chaplain a damn bunch, of course he was, and uh, so from there, uh, about a, so I don't know, a few days later, uh, somebody from NBC Huntley Brinkley report, I forgot his damn name, he, was, he worked for him at that time, he was, you know, anyway, he showed up with the camera crew and all and said, would you, would you quote what you've told the FBI? I said, yeah. So I, re I sit on the front porch. I, uh, I repeat it. And I said, um, you wait till I get out. I'm leaving the county. I said, hell, I know what it comes out. I'm a dead man because they're going to overcome their inhibitions and hell's going to pop loose. So I either wouldn't bother with daddy because uh, uh, he was always leaving Mason in the county, see, and 
A lot of folks don't vote. Of course, it's, it's not, uh, I may get in trouble, you guys are talking it, but the truth of it is, the Amazing Masonic Lodge in Mississippi wasn't, they weren't uh, unanimous, but a lot of them sympathized with the Klan, see. So they said, though, my daddy was the oldest living member, so he had been a member longer than anyone in the county, over about, about 60, almost 60 years. So they said 50, 54 years, I believe, at that time, something like that, 55. So they sent somebody out there to see him. I knew it. I recognized the guy was, was a uh, Masonic man, you know. So when he left, I let got out of the house and let, let him talk to my daddy. And so when he left, my daddy told me, he said, um, you forget about to leave. He said, they're going to kill you. So I got, I, I'm sure. I said, it's not something I think. said, they're going to kill you. I said, yeah, they may kill you in the process. He said, well, they don't, they, they're not going to bother me. He said, I've been, I said, you, that, your Masonic brother, he wouldn't, didn't want to tell me that. Told you they, if I would leave, they'd guarantee your safety. Right? He said, well, you got it figured right. They did guarantee your safety as Masonic Lodge did. And I left. So I played that really long uh, clip for you. Yeah. So that you could hear him tell the story and not me. And the fact is that he actually told the FBI over and over and over again who was involved in these killings. As you can see, he knew the people personally. He had grown up in the, that county. His family was well-to-do. His father was a Klan sympathizer. And the fact of the matter is, he actually didn't have to tell the FBI that. One of the people who were there that night during the killing was an informant for the FBI. So they already knew where the bodies were buried. But if you look at documentaries, TV shows, uh, feature films, or read books about this particular episode, in civil rights history, what you'll find is there's this huge search. And during this search, they you know, find bodies all over the state of Mississippi and rivers and streams and whatnot, but they can't find Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Swerner. All the time they knew uh, where he was. And they did, in fact, uh, shoot at his house the next day after he left his father's house, that they did, in fact, run him out of town. And he didn't come back to Mississippi for 50 years. As a matter of fact, the first time he went back to Neshoba County, uh, he went with me. Now, actually, this is not in my talk, but it just came to me. Uh, I was teaching at the University of Southern Mississippi at the time. He knew I was doing the civil rights movement. He called me out to his house, told me who, who he was, and knew that there was going to be a celebration that summer of the 50th anniversary, and he wanted to go. And, you know, I had heard about him, but had never met him, went to pick him up. He's got this big bag with him, and I help him with it. I mean, he's, uh, in that uh, particular image, he was 80-something, uh, but he died when he was 92. And the bag was really heavy. I said, Mr. Posey, what, what's in this bag, right? And uh, he said, don't worry about that. And I was worried about it. <laughs> uh, so I looked at it, and he's got, like, guns, right? <laughs> He's like, Mr. Posey, what are you doing with all these guns? Uh, he's like, well, we're going into Shelby County, and uh, you might need a gun. I was like, I don't need a gun. He's like, you're going to need one more than I will. Uh, well, he had just never been back and was convinced that people might still be looking for him. And it was about a, a three-hour ride from where we lived, and I had a wonderful, wonderful time with him. But the point here is that this search did not have to happen. And had he not been a gadfly to the FBI, we don't know if these bodies would have ever been found. And uh, just really uh, quickly about that, some 50 some years after that, you know, these people still hadn't been prosecuted, right? And we go out into uh, Neshoba County and everybody is small town Mississippi, right? Like small town anywhere else. Everybody knows everybody and everybody knows everybody's business. Uh, and it had been really clear for years that um, certain people had been involved uh, in these murders, and we wanted to have them prosecuted. Well, we had this long list of names. Many of them were still alive, and the FBI still would not prosecute them. 
Uh, most of them were well-to-do, and they chose this one guy who was mentioned in his talk there, Edgar A. Killen, uh, the preacher, the chaplain for the Klan, because he was the poorest member of the group, right? Uh, where you see these bodies here, that, that is on the land of Olin Burge, the richest man in the county. Everybody knew he hired the bulldozer driver. Everybody knew he had said in a Klan meeting the night before, I've got enough space to bury everybody here for Freedom Summer, right? Everybody knew that. It was actually in a small town news, and Meridian quoted him in a small town newspaper saying that. Uh, and this is 2005, right? And they still would not prosecute. So anyway, Buford Posey is, is one of my unsung heroes because he didn't have to do what he did. He had to leave his home, right? Again, they, they shot uh, at his house the, the next day after he went to visit his father. And he stayed gone for many, many years. And the other thing I want to impress upon you is that when we think about the, the black freedom struggle, when we think about the civil rights movement, we just think about black people doing all this uh, action, taking part in all this activity. The fact of the matter is there were lots and lots of white people involved, not just for Freedom Summer, but for most of these activities. And so uh, the very next year over in Alabama, now, um, there, there's this Selma to Montgomery march. And I should say before I get to that, a month after they found these bodies, President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, right? Remember we talked about all these black people dying, nothing happens. You know, you get the two white people and there's a black person and you get the Civil Rights Act. Next year, now they're pushing for a Voting Rights Act, which you don't need because you got the 15th Amendment, but they're pushing for it anyway, right? And Congress is intransigent. There are these filibusters, this, you know, we're not going to do it on the part of Southern senators and their Northern allies. And you have people like Jonathan Daniels, who comes down to Alabama to help, sees a black woman being accosted by a local sheriff. The sheriff is going to shoot her. He jumps in front of the gun. Sheriff kills Jonathan Daniels. Here he is in this image. How many of us know his name? How many of us know his story? That's what this project seeks to do. Uh, whether the people are still with us or not, they deserve to be acknowledged, uh, discussed, um, and, and taught in, in our classes. At least that's my, my two cents. Similar to Daniels, a woman by the name of Viola Lozo. She's in Detroit, she gets the call from Martin Luther King, as do thousands of people across the country, to come down to this Selma to Montgomery march and help. She does. She comes down. The march is over. There are people. I mean, you, you march. You're walking, right? There's a couple people riding bikes, but, I mean, it's 1965. You're, you're actually walking. March is over. All the speeches are given. Now you got to walk back. Viola Lauzo decides to give people rides back. One of the people she gave a ride happened to be a black man. Turns out the Klan didn't like that. So they pulled up beside her car and shot her in the face and killed her just because she had a black man riding with her. It's tragic. But what we see a month after that is the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So yes, the black people in Alabama are heroes, but so are Ms. Lauzo and Mr. Daniels, and we need to tell their stories. Now, the problem with all of this violence is it elicits a particular response, right? When you can't get a meal at the lunch counter, you sit in. When you can't get an adequate education, you run a desegregation action and get the school to integrate. When you are unable to vote because there are these literacy tests where people ask you, well, how many bubbles in a bar of soap? How many seeds in a watermelon? How old was Jesus when he was born? So it's almost impossible to pass these tests. And if you can do that, it's well nigh impossible to pay the $2 poll tax that's due one year in advance. Now, for the younger people in the crowd, um, $2 is not a lot to you, right? 
But in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, you could get a whole lot of stuff. I mean, I probably can't tell just by looking at me, but I remember when you could buy a soda for 10 cents, right? I remember when you could get a bag of chips for a nickel. Are you think inflation is bad now? How do you think I feel, right? You can't, you can't get a bag of chips for a nickel today. Not even those little ones that they say don't sell in the store sell anyway. Uh, still costs you a lot of money, right? People did not have the $2 to register to vote. If they had $2, they were going to buy food, clothing, and maybe try to pay the rent. So there was much difficulty involved in getting uh, freedom in some of these places. So you register people to vote, and you have them vote. That's how you deal with that. But we've been talking about some of this violence, and people began to respond to the violence in kind. So in Alabama, you got people who formed the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, and they decided to protect themselves with guns. This is one of my favorite images of the movement. Charlie Cobb is a former uh, member of SNCC who wrote this book called This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed. And he basically talks about how there would be no civil rights movement if people did not protect the civil rights workers. Um, I see our Phoenix boys have come in, and so I'm not going to do the whole quote, but I interviewed uh, this woman um, who about nonviolence, and she said uh, to me, you know, nonviolence is fine in the daytime, but that stuff doesn't work at night, right? She called it stuff, uh, which is my word. Uh, and so you could see one of the people here in this image who agrees with her. This woman actually um, kept Klansmen out of her community for an entire election cycle, right? And it, at the end of the day, people who do the kinds of things we're talking about are cowards, right? If, if they're shooting at you and you're not shooting back, that's fine. But when you start shooting back, then you, know, you get to write the vote. And the people that she was voting for actually have been running the offices in Lowndes County since 1968, right? And she didn't have to kill anybody. In any case, uh, what we find is there are lots of people doing this all throughout the South. Georgia, Texas, there's a book about it in Mississippi, that Radio Free Dixie book is about uh, what happens in North Carolina. And so you get these people who, after the Civil Rights Act is signed, the Voting Rights Act is signed, they have lost their jobs. They've been run out of town, and they go to these urban areas, and they wind up training individuals who eventually join the Black Power Movement and telling them, hey, you know, nonviolence is cool in the daytime, but if you want to live through this thing, then you got to be able to protect yourself. And they actually wind up training some of the members uh, of this new organization known as the Black Panther Party, which comes about as a result of the Black Power Movement. And you can see its major tenets there. Now, the Black Panther Party uh, emerges in Oakland, California in 1966. It's started by these two college students, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. And they have, you know, a 10-point platform and program, which I'll show you an image of in a second. But at the end of the day, like I said, they're starting in October 66. And, and the 10 months before the Black Panther Party was founded in Oakland, there are seven murders uh, on the part of sheriff's deputies and police officers, one including a 92-year-old black man in Palo Alto, California. All seven of these murders justifiable homicides. And so we have our Mike Browns and Trayvon Martins and Rakia Boyds, um, certainly the George Floyds. Imagine that happening all the time, right? We feel like it happens all the time, but actually we get a break, right? Uh, I'd like to share with my students the fact that during the lynching era from the 1890s to 1950s, blacks were lynched at a rate of 2.3 a week. 2.3 people a week. Since 1950, uh, police officers have killed black people at the rate of 2.3 a week. So the mob violence has not changed. I make that point because you have people who are no longer interested in being victims 
And the Black Panther Party comes along and says, we're going to defend our community. We're going to register people to vote. We're going to desegregate. We're going to get these schools to do what they're supposed to do. But we're not going to be run off by people who like uh, to kill us. And this is what they set out to do. Other than that, you know, pretty reformist. If you take a look at some of these notes, right? We want freedom. What's, what's wrong with that in a country that says, you know, you can have it? We want full employment. Not a radical thing. I want full employment too. We want to not be exploited. You could go to Watts, which is a community in Los Angeles, and have to pay like a dollar for a loaf of bread. You could then go to Beverly Hills and only have to pay 39 cents for a loaf of bread. The loaf of bread in Watts would have been molded if you're not careful. And so you're paying for these inferior products at really, really high prices, and they don't want to be exploited. I'm not going to read every single one, but you could see there like the kinds of things that they want. And I, I kind of, you know, have a bit of an issue with with number eight, just because you know some of my friends are a little shady. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, not sure what happened there. Okay, let me not do that. Um, but yeah, really reformist. So what they start to do is to serve their community. You have these men and women who come together and they say, we're going to ask the community what they need and then we're gonna give them what they need. They do these surveys in Oakland and San Francisco and Los Angeles and other cities all over the country. Before it's over, there are 42 chapters of the Black Panther Party. Uh, and one of their signature programs, a free breakfast program, sort of spreads all over the country. They're serving 20, sometimes 30,000 children a day nationwide. And then they're turning around giving people free health care. And they're able to do that because they go down to the medical school. They ask the doctors and the medical students, almost all of whom are white. Keep in mind, it's still the 1960s. Will you come help our community? And they say, yeah, right? And free health care for everybody. Black Panther Party is very, very well supported all over the country. The problem is the FBI doesn't like what they're doing. And the FBI wants them uh, to stop what they're doing. And so they decide they are going to stop them. And what they do is create something called the counterintelligence program. And the counterintelligence program, although actually the counterintelligence program was created in 1956 to thwart what was deemed the communist menace. It was retooled in 1967, a year after the Panthers got their start and directed at the Black Panther Party. Um, between 1967 and the time it was supposed to have been disbanded in 1971, there were 295 COINTEL pro actions. Of those 295, 233 were directed at the Black Panther Party. So, um, Lots of bad stuff, and you can see here what they wanted to do. You know, don't let these groups get together. Don't let um, there be something like you know a spokesman like a King or Malcolm X. Um, prevent them from gaining respectability. So when you read uh, local newspapers from the 1960s and 1970s, you see all this negative stuff about the civil rights movement. A lot of us, because every January we get to celebrate Martin Luther King and all that good stuff, don't realize or maybe don't even know that 63% of the American population did not agree with King, thought he was way too radical. I mean, he's cool now that he's dead, but when he was alive, people was like, uh, that's a little bit too much for me. And so one of the ways they dealt with that was to write these really uh, horrendous art articles in newspapers. And of course, whenever they got on TV, they would um, uh, denigrate them as well. And of course, they didn't want them to, to grow. So in 1969, the director, um, J. F., uh, J. Edgar Hoover, told Congress that the Panthers were the greatest threat to the internal security of the country. Well, Martin Luther King is already dead, and most people are thinking, well, if you're gonna kill King, where else do I have to go? And uh, many of them start to uh, join the Black Panther Party in droves. And so what J. Edgar Hoover did was to find the most effective leaders of this organization all over the country, either run them out of the country, send them uh, to jail, you know, 
beat them and just make them leave the party, and in very extreme cases, kill them. And I'll share a few examples of that um, with you. This guy, El Prentice Bunchy Carter, was the leader of one of the largest chapters of the Black Panther Party. Uh, that was the one in Los Angeles. He was so effective that he found himself on J. Edgar Hoover's list. There was a meeting in a room very much like this one on the campus of UCLA, where a Carter uh, attended because students there asked him to moderate a discussion between them over who was gonna be the next um, director of the Black Studies, the, the new Black Studies program that UCLA was founding. Well, uh, there were FBI informants in that crowd. There was a ruckus, and at the end of that ruckus, our apprentice Bunchy Carter and a friend he had with him wound up dead. Uh, his friend was John Huggins. Now, the culprits were, were caught, they were tried, they were sent to prison, and they are the only two people that have ever escaped San Quentin. Go figure. Yeah, must have been really smart, smart dudes. So they killed him, right? Outright killed him. Same thing happens in Chicago with Mark Clark and Fred Hampton. Mark Clark is the defense captain of the Black Panther Party from Peoria, Illinois, and Fred Hampton is the uh, chairman of the entire statewide party. And what he was good at doing was convincing people that there was injustice. Fred had actually attracted a significant number of white and Latinx people to the Panther banner. They couldn't join the party, but they could organize their own groups, and they were doing it, and they were doing it big time. You're talking free breakfast, uh, free health clinics, free clothing drives, voter like they were doing it in Chicago. And so Hoover thought it was time for Fred to go. And he got with the state's attorney's office, uh, the Chicago Police Department's gang intelligence unit, sent some FBI agents in at four o'clock in the morning on December 4th, 1969, they kill Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. Clark was at the door, guarding the door with the guns at the Panther office. Uh, somebody knocks on the door. Clark says, who is it? The answer is Tommy. And he says, Tommy who? And the guy responds, Tommy Gunn, and shoots him through the heart. Clark dies immediately. A second sub-team comes through the back door, sees that Fred Hampton is laying in the bed. He had actually been drugged the night before by an FBI informant named William O'Neill, for those people who saw Judas and the Black Messiah, uh, and for those of you who did Yeah, this black dude uh, was pretending to be a panther and uh, put, according to the autopsy, enough barbiturates in Fred's Kool-Aid to kill an elephant, right? It's really crazy. So he's dazed and drugged, and this second sub-team comes in from the back, and one guy, Carmody, Officer Carmody asks, is he dead? So the guy, Gloves Davis, says, uh, no, looks like he's still alive. And what everybody, we're, I'm getting this from the trial transcript, right? This is what I learned from reading um, what happened in court. Everybody hears these two shots. And everybody hears Comrade say, he's good and dead now. And that was the end of Fred Hampton. Murdered him in, in cold blood. I mean, some weeks, months later, they had to change their story, but still, a cold-blooded murder. And you can see how happy they were about this. And the Chicago police are quite pleased with their work. And so this is what the government was doing. This is what local governments were doing, state governments were doing, federal governments were doing. You would think, you know, based on what you learned in school, the government is for liberty and equality. But the liberty and equality that we are enjoying today are because of these unsung heroes that we're talking about, not because of some voluntary you know, reaction on the part of our government. And so I'm going to uh, wrap up here, and hopefully we can have a little dialogue. But uh, I'm, I want to share with you this one last story about what happens in the, in the Black Panther Party, because this, this guy, you know, goes on uh, pretty good about it. And this is actually not quite a plug for my book, but uh, I, was gonna, I was gonna show you, uh, and I'm not now because I'm running out of time, I was gonna show you a, a clip uh, from this video where um, Stanley Nelson made this movie uh, called Vanguard of the Revolution. Some of you might have seen it. 
And I I put this here because I thought it was funny. Like all the dialogue in that clip comes out of my book. And I saw um, that movie and I saw Stanley Nelson in Santa Monica and took him to task about that. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry, I'll get you next time. Uh, Yeah, you sure will get me next time. But, But in any case, what the clip was about was four days after the killing in Chicago, they go to Los Angeles. They're looking for the major leaders in Los Angeles. And you've heard of the SWAT team because every city has one. But in 1969, the only SWAT team in the country was in Los Angeles. And this was its first outing. So on the morning of December 8th, 1969, SWAT members and 200 other members of the LAPD attacked the Black Panther office at 41st and Central. And they kick in the door and they start shooting and the Panthers start shooting back. And they drive the SWAT team out. Well, they weren't expecting them to shoot back. And we know that they weren't expecting them to shoot back because in the trial transcript, we read what were they saying as they were coming out of the building. And they were saying, they're shooting back. They're shooting back. You know, it's four in the morning. You're supposed to be asleep. All right. Uh, not ready to shoot. In in any case, they defended themselves, and four hours later, they were still shooting. (laughs) And and the gun, um, that gun battle ended when the Panthers ran out of bullets. And there were two women in that building that day, and the men, quite frankly, were afraid to come outside because they thought that they'd be killed. And so one of the women, Samaya Moore, person they call Peaches, came out with this white flag and everybody was relieved, especially the cops. And we know the cops were relieved because we have oral histories with them. You know, not quite unsung heroes, but we still have, have talked to them. And they said they were so glad these guys had given up. And, you know, they all, of course, went to trial for attempted murder on police officers. And believe it or not, they all got found not guilty. Uh, jury in Los Angeles thought, well, the police shot first. It's okay to defend yourself. I want to share with you um, the story of a person who was supposed to be in that office. He wasn't in that. They were looking to kill him. They're looking to kill all of these leaders, right? They were looking to kill him, and he wasn't in that office. And so I'm going to play, again, uh, a rather lengthy clip, uh, but I think you'll like it, about him talking about how they then came up with another plan to assassinate him. Um, How do we, is that it? Yeah. This is Harold Taylor. He's one of the founders of the Black Panther Party in Los Angeles. He started the breakfast program in San Diego, in Bakersville, in Santa Ana, in Los Angeles, and in Pasadena. And you'd think there wouldn't be a need for a breakfast program in Pasadena, right? There was in 1968. So they thought he was one to be eliminated. The person doing that kind of work, let's get rid of him. So here's his his story. After they couldn't kill him that night, they went looking for him another night. Uh, Yeah. Uh, 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 Charles Pratt, Geronimo's brother, Chuck, contacted me and said, uh, Geronimo got some stuff that he wants you to pick up that you can have, that you're going to need, you know? Some technical equipment. Technical equipment. Right. For the, for the, for the Army, for the underground. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to have to defend ourselves, you know. We're living that life. They've been killing us, you know, so be prepared to defend yourself. And I'm like, okay, what do you need me to do? Well, I want you to have it. and You go pick it up. I got a guy that's going to bring it to you. You know, so I said, catch your weapons. Okay, I'll pick it up. Are you sure about this guy? Yeah, he's good. He's good. I vouch for him. I don't know him. I don't like dealing with people I don't know, especially with weapons. And they may be hot weapons. I don't know what kind of weapons they are. I don't know where they come from, you know. Didn't much care, really. But I, I talked to the guy on the phone. He called me. My mother's house, which was strange. He called me. He said, I got this for you. Can you pick it up? I told him, sure. 
where at? He told me, nine o'clock, gave me the address, meet me there, I'll be there. I felt bad about it, so we went back and I asked Chuck again, are you sure? My first thought told me, this, is, this doesn't feel good. And normally, I don't feel good about it, I won't do it. But I go against it because Chuck has convinced me. Deronimo has been solid. I had no reason not to believe Deronimo. You got to trust somebody, you know. So I go. I get ready to go, and I'm going by myself. And Ray asks me, where you going? I said, I got to make a run. I'll be back about an hour. I'll go with you. So you got a gun? I said, I got two guns. He said, wait a minute. He goes back now to get his gun. You know, he ready to get in the car. Here comes JB out the door. Where y'all going? I want to go. Ray said, well, you better go get you something there. Because uh, she would say we shouldn't be riding around without nothing. Because it was hot there. LAPD, police department, and the party, and us organization. So I got enemies all around me. I'm un very un uncomfortable. So we go. And on the way over there, I'm telling them, if it don't look right, we're going to break. And so when we got there, I knocked on the door. And this lady, a little old lady, come to the door and I asked her, I says, uh, yes, ma'am, is Duck home? She says, don't know Duck live here. I said, Duck young. She said, no, Duck lives here. I said, this is fucked up. I looked at the address, same address. I get back and I look. I stand on the porch and I look down the street. And I look down the street. What's going on? There's a lot of cars parked on both sides of the street. I showed you that street. When we first came there, Ray had passed the house. I said, you're going to have to go down the block and turn around. Come back, you just passed it. So the whole time we driving, I'm looking in cars, parked cars. And I see two silhouettes. But then all of a sudden, I don't see but one. This is at the end of the block. I give it a play. There's somebody waiting for somebody, maybe. I don't know. I told JB, you see them people in that car? He said, don't worry about it, everything's good. We get back to the house, that's when I go knock. When I come out of the steps, I, I go to the window, I tell JB, give me a gun. Tell Ray, give me his gun. Y'all give me your shit. I'm gonna go through this alley, I'm gonna meet some alleys. When I get safe, I'll call you. Y'all break. Man, Ray goes, get in the car. <laughs> we haven't done anything. Everything is cool. JB, yeah, T, get in the car. Okay, I get in the car. And uh, we pull off. I'm looking, man. I'm paranoid as hell. First thing I do is look behind us. Them headlights come on. That doesn't feel good. So we're going down the street. I see two more silhouettes on the opposite side of the street. I'm looking. They're two black guys, though. I was just, okay, there's two brothers sitting up, probably getting high, you know. So we go down, we make that turn, and I just have them, we're making that turn before we leave that block. I take one more look at that driver's side of the window in the back seat. That car pulls, turns around, and comes right behind us. I said, they, they followed us. Right then, I thought it was members of the party, or the US organization. I didn't think nothing of the police at the time. I thought it was them. And Duck had set us up for members of the party to kill us. That's what I thought. But we went down the street a little bit. By then I took my gun out of my waistband and I set it right here. I had my 45 under my leg. And so I was sitting there and when we pulled off, I told Ray, I said, whatever you do, stay on a lit street, a well-lit street, so we can see what's going on. Then out of nowhere comes a black and white police car. Fast, too. Whips around the corner, past everybody, gets directly up behind us, as if he knew what car to pick out, and then put the lights on us. I said, oh, 
this is a bus. I said, they got a bus right here. I said, hey, we haven't done anything right. Gun charge in LA at the time, 65.50. We'll get out. All we gotta do is give them 65.50 a piece, we get out. But this don't look like no regular bus. <laughs> this is not a misdemeanor 65.50 bus. And I told Ray, don't pull over. Right here, it's too dark. And he missed the turn, a gauge. And I said, oh, man, you're going right by the junior high school. It's at nighttime, but it's extra dark right there. And Ray pulled over. I said, what are you doing? I said, don't pull over. He said, man, calm down, T. And when they're coming up, this cop comes up to the window. And he hits the back, he, you know, he hits the back of the car with his left hand. He had his pistol in his right hand. I see this guy. I'm watching him as he coming. Because I'm sitting, he's coming to me. Southern cop is coming to the driver's side. He's past me. He gets up there and he says something to Ray. This other cop hits the back of the hood. He thinks I'm going to turn and look, but I don't. Instead of turning and look that way, I look this way. And when I look that way, there he is with his gun in my face. He says, put your hands on the front seat. Put my hands on the front seat. I said, what's the problem, officer? He said, I said, put your fucking hands on the front seat. I said, hey, man, my hands are on the front seat. He said, I said, do it now. And he's shaking. And I said, this son bitch is going to shoot, you know. And no sooner than I thought that, I pulled my head back and there was this big flash come right across my face. And I just reached, instinctively grabbed my pistol and come back. And I was like this. And he shot again. It hit me in the leg. And I started shooting at him. Next thing I know, I see this cop in the air and I'm still shooting at him. And this other cop is shooting and Ray starts shooting. And then it's this, all kind of gunfire out of nowhere. A semi-automatic rifle I could hear. Bam, 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 bam. He's coming from the driver's side straight across to me. So I lay down when it get to my turn. When he goes back, I come up and I start shooting at him. So he breaks and runs towards the high school. Ray and JB, everybody, it's just going on, man. It's a firefight. And it seems like there's just bullets coming from everywhere. And uh, I didn't even know I had been shot in the head. I just felt warm stuff running down my face. And all of a sudden, my pistol flies out of my hand. I got hit in the wrist. So I grab my 45 and I come up with it and a jacket to put around in the chamber. And soon I turn that way, something hit me in the back of my elbow. I dropped my gun and I couldn't move my right arm no more. So I had my gun in my hand trying to shoot out the window at this cop that was just blazing, you know. But I could see the silhouette, but I haven't hit him at all. And he's constantly moving. Before I know it, he's at the front of the car and there's somebody with a shotgun behind us shooting. So I'm trying to eliminate the shotgun guy, you know. And then I get hit right here with buckshot in my hand. That gun comes out. So next thing I know, we all in there. And all I could hear is uh, moaning because we all was wounded. And I was just laying in the back seat looking up, man. And I, Damn, they're going to kill us. I got them trying to get my gun in my hand for they come up to kill us. I'm just thinking, I'm going to kill him as soon as he run up to this window. Let me get my gun. And this old lady, I could see her face in the window. I showed you that window. It's the only thing I could see was her face. And she was crying and screaming. They're all bleeding. They're all shot up. That helicopter was over us. Big spotlight. She could see in the car and everything. They had us pent. We wasn't going anywhere. They shot out the tires. And uh, the community came out. Don't kill him, don't kill him. Nobody's in the car shooting back. I could hear him. And uh, Ray, I told him, I said, Ray, uh, I think he shot me in the head. Ray people told me, he said, ah, you all right? You know? <laughs> I'm all right, okay. I said, I can't move. Uh, JB, JB, I get, he wouldn't answer me. I said, oh, I didn't kill him, you know? So the nigga, I knew was, they would have me by the ankles, dragging me out of the car. And there was dust flying there where they were stomping and kicking. And when I got to the hospital, they had to shave my head to get there. Hospital. And yeah. 
and actually he he winds up calling this lawyer whose name you know, um, Johnny Cochran. I mean, he doesn't. There, there's a, a black nurse in the general hospital there in, in Los Angeles who asks, is there anybody you want me to call? He says, yeah, my mom. The black nurse calls his mom. His mom calls Johnny Cochran. And the rest is kind of history. They wind up going to court behind this. And um, they all get found not guilty. A jury of their peers decide that, you know, the police shot first. And again, it's OK to defend yourself. And we see this happen all over the country with the Panthers in New Orleans and Winston-Salem, North Carolina and New York City. You get these large trials that really self-defense trials and you get juries all over the country who go not guilty. So um, I have done what I typically do, which is uh, not plan well. And we have run out of time. And I just wanted to share with you the stories of just some of the unsung heroes whose um, lives that we're capturing on audio and videotape. And I think that we are going to be well, well served with these stories because it's fine to learn about what Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and Angela Davis did. They too are heroes. But the fact of the matter is ordinary people People who work, people who don't work, men and women, northerners and southerners, black and white, quite frankly, rich and poor, got together to make this country a better place. They decided that the power really does belong with the people. And I will leave you with just that and to say to you, all power to the people. All right. So now we are going to have um, a very, very special treat from the Phoenix Boys Choir. I hope you guys are ready. I hope you're feeling good. Uh, Mr. Washington, is everything OK? OK. Uh, so please stick with us. And as was mentioned earlier, we are going to have a reception where free food will be served. And we hope that you'll stay with us after we hear these renditions. And so if you will join me in please welcoming the Phoenix Boys Choir. <laughs> 